representing here uh, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. And if people haven't come across that yet, it's uh, an independent um, CEO-led organization of some 200 uh, companies that are interested in uh, new developments and new ways of thinking about their interaction with the environment. Um, the second partner up there, IEC and Global Economics Programme, is a program run, run from the IEC and Secretariat in Gond with a world coverage. And the aim of that program is to help explain economic concepts and to run economic programs and enable communities, governments, what's called people, to better understand the economic opportunities that biodiversity can provide for livelihoods and economic development, poverty reduction, a whole range of other topics. The Global Nature Fund, uh, 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 excuse me, a third partner, is an international organisation, uh, and they're, they're interested in protection of the environment and nature, so we're looking forward to hearing their contribution. And as I mentioned, um, maybe I didn't mention, I'm uh, Nick Connor and I'm representing the IUCN World Commission on Protected Areas and I look after a small task force on economic valuation. Uh, the World Conservation, World Commission on Protected Areas is one of the IUCN commissions with a large number of people interested in um, promoting the concept and the practicality of protected areas for human welfare and biodiversity management. Just quickly what our session objectives are. We're hoping that at the end of this session we will have raised awareness amongst you about the opportunities and risks of using quantitative and monetarised <coughs> techniques to, to place values on ecosystems and impacts on the ecosystems from particular activities. We're also hoping that this workshop will help to encourage people to think about using ecosystem uh, and economic valuation as a tool in attempts to mitigate impacts on the environment and ecosystems. And uh, the structure of the workshop is it's a combination of presentations, uh, but we're also having some interactive exercises. So I'm hoping that you'll all participate in that and feel some ownership of what's coming out of what we're doing today. So I'd just like to move on to the first presentation of the session. And uh, I'd like to welcome Tobias Hartman and Marion Hamel from Global Nature Fund. I'm going to hopefully, I'm sure, entertain you with some interactive activities. Good morning. You closer to the a little bit closer to the item of today, we prepared a small quiz, and um, it's not a quiz to where you will be able to win one million dollar. Unfortunately, not. But you will win maybe a little bit more of information, and you will find three sheets of paper on your on your chair, uh, red yellow and green and this you need for voting so i hope that you are prepared for the first question the total economic value of insect pollination worldwide is it 49 billion euro 153 billion euro or 387 million euro. What do you think? Please vote now. Up, up. Okay. I hope it works. It is yellow. Really. How can, okay. how can it be so, so precise, 150 mm -hmm. it seems ridiculous. That's all we're going to talk about. <laughs> uh, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Therefore, you need methodologies. So, the next question. The value of the ecosystem services that are lost due to deep water horizon oil spill, how much do you think? Was it 130 billion US dollars? 670 or 980 billion US dollar. What do you think? Please vote. Hmm. Okay. 
Let's have a look. Yellow again. Don't be confident in the yellow. <laughs> but in this case, it works. Mangroves provide coastal protection for free. How much would it cost to replace this function? 1,320 uh, 1, US dollars per hectare. 3,679 or 5,235 US dollars per hectare. What do you think? Okay, let's have a look. <laughs> okay, and we have one more question. Puma calculated the environmental costs in 2010 for water, greenhouse gases, land use, air pollution, and waste production for the entire production globally. How high were those costs? 275 million euro, 145 million euro, or uh, 71 million euro for 2010. What is your opinion? Hands up. This is not fair to be. <laughs> <laughs> 145. Yellow is Tobias' <laughs> favorite color. <laughs> he likes yellow, I see. And related to this, what do you think? Which percentage of the company's 2010 profit was this? 10%? 45% or 70%? Please vote. Please vote. Okay. 70%. You see, it's not trivial environmental <coughs> costs, and we come into our topic. Tobias. What do you. What can you say us about valuation? I will just make a couple of, of comments. Um, from our point of view, um, we are coordinating the European. Uh, uh, we are coordinating the uh, project called the European Business and Biodiversity, Biodiversity Campaign. So that is why um, we are also very interested in environmental management tools. Is it uh, I can take that. Um, so and also that's why we are very interested in this corporate ecosystem valuation um, instrument and that's why uh, we will make a, just a couple of comments first on valuation of ecosystems in general um, the biggest important thing is obviously as, as we all know um, that the environment is still considered a public good which can be used and destroyed at no cost um, so here valuation can actually be very beneficial as it can help to in internalize those adverse impacts and foster sustainable um, uh, sustainable behavior, not only from of companies but also of uh, citizens. But what you, you have to keep in mind is that um, biodiversity and ecosystem services are very complex and very hard to measure and even harder to value. Which also leads directly to the question: if everything um, should be valued, and to the questions uh, uh, question whether um, what happens to species. Um, with no value, which do not deliver a direct service um, for, for, for example, for the economy. Um, when it comes to valuation in the corporate context, which is the topic of our um, workshop today, is um, we believe that um, this tool um, has, is at a very early stage, but we see that it has a lot of potential because it can help to raise awareness among companies for the value of biodiversity and ecosystem services and it can help to include those aspects in the decision-making in the, in the decision processes. From the case studies um, that are already um, available, which are only a few, only a, a couple of first lessons can be learned. And um, the first one of this is um, that you see that um, the estimates and therefore the results of those valuation studies, for example, the Puma case that we saw before, um, depend very strongly on the assumptions that are being made. For example, we see that um, we have in five um, studies, um, five <coughs> different values that are, have been um, calculated for, the, uh, for carbon dioxide emissions with a wide range from $4 to um, 66 euros. 
And so therefore, um, we believe that uh, if we want to move forward with this tool that a standardized um, approach or a standardized uh, net, um, framework is clearly needed um, so that uh, the confidence in this uh, tool can be increased and that uh, this tool can really have a big impact. This also obviously is directly related to the question of the evaluation method. Um, so far, um, the method of choice has been a uh, benefit transfer method and Natalie will go into more detail about um, the different um, choices that a company has if, you, if it wants to um, value ecosystems. Um, but the question on, uh, on benefit transfer is basically if, uh, or as I said, there are different um, valuation methods available. So the question is um, which one uh, sh should, uh, should, should one choose? And uh, basically the, the idea to go forward with corporate ecosystem valuation, the only choice I think um, we have is that we learn by doing and more companies obviously should uh, test their tool so that we can learn from the experience every company makes and uh, in the end create a more robust, um, more robust framework and uh, finally hope to, um, hope to um, uh, really uh, use the potential of this tool. Besides uh, CBD, what do you, do you believe is uh, actually needed too? Um, the biggest important thing in our, our opinion is um, that um, companies uh, should be, um, should report, uh, should be reported in environmental damages and that this should be mandatory because um, when you look at the CV, the biggest thing in our opinion, the biggest addition of value this has is the quantification of impacts. Um, the valuation itself doesn't really um, add that much value in our opinion. But then uh, also we have to keep in mind that knowing the impacts is very good, but um, so far the companies um, have not really um, took any action on this. So, so far, no costs have been internalized, which obviously also um, uh, leads um, to the question um, whether these costs of environmental goods or environmental protection um, can be passed on to the consumers, or if a consumer, if for example, Puma raises the cost of their shoes by, uh, by a couple of euros, if the, if the consumer will simply switch to buy uh, Nike shoes. And, um, also, the related question to internalization is um, how effective compensation can be ensured. And lastly, the last comment is whether um, maybe there's an alternative to this valuation approach. Maybe we can use uh, a more indirect, uh, um, indirect approach by uh, integrating costs by using market-based instruments such as emissions trading um, as an alternative to this um, valuation. I think that's everything. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, now I'd like to pass on to our next presenter, Natalie Olson. So now you see her left hand side. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to jump straight into uh, looking at some of the methodologies for valuation because I've got about 15 minutes, I think. Can you hear me? Yeah. Just wave if, I, if the mic moves from my mouth. Um, now, why do we try to place monetary values on environmental goods and services? We basically know that ecosystems provide a wide range of tangible marketable goods, and we've seen um, a lot of accounting and provisioning services, food, timber, uh, prices are more or less accurate and reflect values. Um, and we've also seen um, an increasing recognition of the many uh, more intangible functions that ecosystems provide, so nutrient recycling and climate regulation, for example. But we do have these problems of population growth and economic development, um, which have been, uh, resulted in environmental degradation. Um, so we know that society needs to make trade-offs, and these trade-offs aren't as stark as they used to be pictured. Now we're now looking at more green growth and uh, biodiversity friendly growth. But nevertheless, there are trade-offs. We live in a resource constrained world. And there are also trade-offs between current consumption and future um, consumption, which we need to think about. Um, in order to compare different types of costs and benefits, of ecological, economic, cultural values, 
it helps to measure them with the same numerator. So we can, uh, by using uh, economic valuation, we can feed uh, information about ecosystem impacts and dependencies um, into uh, the cost-benefit analyses that we either explicitly or implicitly make when we're making decisions, and that's for consumers, for businesses, for governments, and so on. <coughs> now, why do we need special methods for environmental goods and services? For normal goods, the value of goods and services is based on the cost of production on the supply side and on the expected utility of consumers on the demand side. And the relative scarcity determines the price of this balance of supply and demand. Uh, generally for market goods, um, the prices are a good estimate, a good approximation of the value of a good. We don't think too much about how much we pay for a litre of milk. Uh, but we think a lot about what we pay for carbon or for biodiversity, if we're paying for it at all. Um, and many ecosystem goods and services don't have prices, and this is because many are public goods. Um, we can't be, exclude each other from their use, and they don't get used up. If I breathe in fresh air, it doesn't um, restrict your consumption of fresh air. And because no one owns or has property rights, uh, over these public goods. Uh, price signals are weak, and incentives for sustainable management and individual conservation um, are also weak. Now, this is an example um, taken from, the, from T. It's a study done by TrueCost, and it basically illustrates the divergence between public and social, social and private costs um, due to this lack of, of pricing for um, ecosystem services. Now we see that the market price of timber in China, um, and I think this is this a number of years ago, was roughly 55 US dollars per cubic meter. But the actual cost of producing that timber, if you take into account the ecosystem impacts of producing that timber, were over $100 per cubic meter of timber. And that's based on uh, the flood damage caused by the removal of trees uh, on steep slopes slopes of property loss from flooding, the loss of river transport capacity due to sedimentation linked to erosion, desertification, reduced lumber output, loss of plant nutrients. Um, the more that we account for these, and this, this involves the biophysical measurements of uh, changes in ecosystem services as a result of economic activity, uh, the more we can measure these biophysical changes and value them, the more stark um, the situation becomes, it, it basically allows us to make much more informed decisions about the full costs of our resource use. Sorry, I don't have a button, I've got the mouse and I'm jumping up and down um, in the slides. Now this uh, slide, and I'm not going to go into detail, but it basically outlines uh, a framework of total economic value. Um, and it's, it's not a methodology, it's a framework which um, is based on the idea that ecosystems have many different types of values. Even though individuals may focus on particular values, using this framework forces us to look at all the different types of values. And they're generally categorized into use and non-use values. And use values are fairly straightforward. We have direct use of ecosystems, hunting, fishing, timber harvesting, for example. Indirect use refers more to the regulating and sometimes supporting functions of ecosystems. So erosion control, the regulation of stream flows, storm protection functions of mangroves. Option value refers to the value people uh, place on having the option to use something in future. So it's, it's still a use value, but it's something you want to conserve um, as an insurance policy for uncertainty uh, in the future. And finally, we have uh, non-use value, and the main one is existence value, which is the value people have for something which they never intend to use, but they gain uh, utility um, from knowing that something continues to exist. So we see in wealthy countries existence values for large charismatic species like rhinoceros and elephants and so on. And people are generally willing to pay um, for the conservation of these species. And in the lower section of the slide um, are listed some valuation methods which are used for the different types of values and the different types of ecosystem services. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail now, but we'll go through these um, in the following slides. This is another way of looking at it. It's 
from the Epic Idol ecosystem valuation, uh, which this event is, is talking about. And it's basically linking the different types of services to benefits and the valuation techniques uh, in a more straightforward way, going from the more simple techniques at the top, uh, the more quick um, resource, uh, but they require less time and resource, to the more complex um, demanding methodologies at the bottom. I, I just want to emphasize that um, all valuation, whether it's based on a production function approach or um, surveys asking people for their preferences, um, they all rely on the integration of ecology and economics. Um, we can't be very precise about the value of changes in ecosystem services without very good scientific knowledge on the actual changes. So we need to have the um, good data on the biophysical changes. <coughs> now, the first set of valuation me methodologies um, are based on, on market prices. And uh, the first is basically you use market or social uh, prices combined with new information on physical changes. Um,